e to the power delta from h q. Uh, take n of these, i equals one to n, uh, with delta tau n equals beta, uh, and you take n goes to infinity. So this is just a trivial identity. So you write it this way, and then you insert complete set of states, uh, and you end up then with a model in one higher dimension. The extra dimension is the time dimension with n steps. Uh, and then if you look at the Hamiltonian, <coughs> that appears here, uh, you end up with this particular model with some you know, coupling constants that are not isotropic in the space and time directions. So this is a very standard mapping that's reviewed in many, uh, uh, many review articles. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. There's a homework problem. With Excuse me? Yes. I'm wondering if uh, the small g here is related to the inverse temperature or um, in the quantum Hamiltonian, there's an additional small g, right? Right. So what happens in the quantum Hamiltonian, there are the spatial plaquettes, and then there are the temporal plaquettes. Okay, so this is space, uh, not a very good drawing. This is the time direction. Uh, and the temporal plaquette, spatial plaquette has a coupling k, and the temporal uh, plaquettes will have some coupling k tau. So I've just put them equal here for simplicity, but really for this mapping, they should be different. Uh, and so the G will be related to K tau, basically. Uh, this beta here, uh, it, it, the beta here for the quantum Hamiltonian, the temperature uh, is actually the size of the system in the time direction. Uh, and that's gone to infinity. So if you're looking at the thermodynamic limit of this problem, is equivalent to looking, uh, if you're looking at the, uh, the thermodynamic limit of this problem, uh, is equivalent to looking at the zero temperature limit of this problem. Okay, yeah, so there's no connection between beta and any other topics. The connection between k tau and k uh, and k and g is independent of beta. Okay, uh, so I'm not going to go into this because it's very standard. Um, if, especially for, you know, probably seen it for the Ising chain is related to this, just a single qubit. It's the same trickery. And the only subtlety here is the question of gauge invariance. And there's also the sigma ij on the time directions here. Uh, and to do this mapping, you choose a gauge in the sigma ij and the time direction are always equal to one. Uh, and once you do that, uh, then the whole thing just proceeds. Okay, so this is the quantum Z2 gauge theory uh, with product of Zs around a plaquette um, and uh, a transverse field or an X operator acting on every plaquette. It's closely related to the toric code. Uh, the toric code uh, is another version of it where you've got four Xs over here too. Uh, that's exactly solvable. But the toric code is the feature that it's uh, actually always in the fractionized phase. This particular model is not exactly solvable, uh, but it has the advantage that it gives you both phases. It gives you both the fractionized phase and the trivial phase as a function of the ratio of G over K. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, so what about the Z2 gauge invariance here? That's another uh, extremely important property. Uh, is this thing Z2 gauge invariance? Well, it does have a Z2 gauge invariance, but it now it's time independent and just acts on the operators. So this particular Hamiltonian also has a uh, Z2 gauge invariance. Uh, under which these operators, everything here is an operator, Z and the X operator, uh, where Zij of course goes to eta i, Zij eta j. Uh, but xij uh, goes to xij. <clears throat> um, and that's easy to implement, actually. Uh, that's if you have a qubit, you just form a 90 degree rotation about the x axis, and that sends z to minus z uh, and y to minus y, but x to x. So that's a permissible transformation where you flip the sign of z, but don't flip the sign of x. So there is some operator that will perform this, this operation. 
Uh, and in this case, in fact, uh, it's associated with uh, uh, a set of conserved charges. Uh, conserved charges that commute to the Hamiltonian. And those conserved trans charges are called Xi, uh, sorry, Gi, uh, because uh, as, that's kind of like the analog of Gauss's law in the electrodynamics. So Gi will take to be the product of uh, on, a, on, a, on a plus sign of the axis. So let me just show this over here now. Uh, So here's my square lattice. I mean, this can be done at any lattice, but the square is just the simplest. Um, if I take the product for every side i, I take the product of x, these four x's on the plus sign, uh, that product uh, that's equal to gi. Okay. So this is an operator that commutes with this Hamiltonian. Well, it obviously commutes with the X operator. Now the X operator at any given length, anti-commutes with the Z. Uh, but now you notice that this particular plus sign uh, always overlaps with an even number of Zs. So if I take a, the plaquette of this plaquette, there will be these two Xs and the two Zs, and, and therefore the GI commutes with the Hamiltonian. So, so really the Hilbert space of this Hamiltonian as written down splits apart into uh, different sectors, each of which has a different value of the G. I can T, the square of the G is one by, by definition, G squared is one. So I can set the Gs to be anything I want and we'll get a different Hilbert space with different properties. Okay, so, what, so there seems to be some arbitrariness here and we do have to choose the Gs to be something uh, to be well defined. Now, for this particular mapping, when I started from the Z2 gauge theory and I came to this theory, uh, in fact, what I need uh, is for G to be equal uh, to the following. Well, in fact, with the gauge series as I have defined, uh, GI, all the GI have to equal one. Okay. All right. So, so as I said, the next second part of the lecture today will be uh, trying to make a connection to realistic models of spins, which might have perhaps my spaces. Uh, and when you do that, what you end up finding is that you don't always get this theory. If you get something closely related, and that's related to this empty space that I put over here. So what you get is the following theory, and this is what I'm going to show you by the end of today's lecture, I hope. Uh, product on I, there's a factor here, which is not always equal to one. I plus time, take the product of the sigmas along the time direction to the power of two S. Okay, so this seems rather mysterious, uh, and I hopefully won't be by the end of today's lecture. Uh, it's just some, phase factor, it's like a topological term. It's associated with some uh, anomalies that we'll say a little bit about. Uh, and, this has, and this power here uh, is, uh, is a memory of the spin of the underlying antiferromagnet or the density of the underlying bosons. So for integer densities of bosons, this factor is always one and spin is an integer. But when the density is half integer or the spin is a half integer, then this factor matters. Okay. So, so then there's another interesting exercise. Suppose I take the limit J1 goes to zero, then I have the Z2 gauge theory here with this extra factor. And then I go backwards uh, to the quantum model. What is this strange factor in the quantum limit? So that's where it turns out to be much simpler uh, to think about in the quantum limit. Uh, this turns out to be minus one 
to the 2s. Okay, <laughs> so the purpose of my lecture today is to basically uh, show you how this model arises from a realistic system. It's essentially a pure Z2 gauge theory. It can describe both the fractionalized and the non fractionalized phases of realistic systems of bosons at integer or half integer filling or antiferromagnets with definite spin S, integer or half integer. Uh, they are described by these effective Z2 gauge theories, which could be on any lattice. Uh, and there's some memory of the filling of the bosons, uh, of the density of the bosons or the spin uh, that comes into this constraint. You have to look at different sectors of the Hilbert space of the Z2 gauge theory, and GI is minus one to the 2s. Okay. Then we still have the task of understanding the properties of this gauge theory. In particular, what is this extra factor of minus one here? How does this change the phase diagram? Uh, hopefully, I'll have time to say a little bit more about that too. But for now, I'm going to now change gears completely and start from a realistic model of an anti magnet and show you by a fairly standard mean field methods, how in the end you can derive, you know, in, some, in a certain one over n expansion, uh, exactly this model here. Okay. All right, any questions to where we are going to go? And as a statement, the main claim. Well, the claim is this is, this is if, if I'm going to have fractionalized phases or other interesting phases in some one of boson system, one of spin system, or a Bose uh, interacting Bose gas, uh, then uh, this is one of the simplest ways to get it. You, you describe by an effective Z2 gauge theory, which has a bunch of conserved quantities, uh, and the conserved quantities have to be fixed at certain very special values. Which is dictated by the microscopic physics. Okay. All right. So then let's uh, now change gears and we'll keep this aside uh, and we'll try to understand this from uh, a completely different starting point and much more realistic than the toy models we've been playing with so far. Um, I should say the connection between this very phase term here and this constraint, again, can be done by the usual Trotter methods. Uh, and it's, there's a problem in the notes where I outline the approach uh, and give you references of papers in the literature that go through all the steps. Okay. Um, all right, so what I'm going to use now is a, a related tool, but it has a different name usually. It's called, called the parton method or the slave particle method. And for definite that's not, this is the model we look at. Uh, we'll take uh, the triangular lattice. Uh, Right. Well, okay. <laughs> All right. That's a very bad looking triangle lattice. Uh, and uh, there are spins on each side of the triangle lattice. Uh, SI squared uh, and is equal to S times S plus one. Um, and the Hamiltonian will take full uh, SU2 spin rotation symmetry, uh, sum on. Uh, nearest neighbors, let's say, with a coupling J, uh, SI dot SK. Okay, um, so here's a very well defined Hamiltonian, uh, which can be realized in many experimental systems. Uh, you have a triangle lattice of spin S. The spins are usually on some transition metal ion, uh, and there's some exchange coupling, which is anti ferromagnetic uh, between. Nearest neighbors, and there's also possibly further neighbor interactions. So models like this have been studied a great deal, and uh, the the pure nearest neighbor model, I think the consensus is 
pretty much that it has long range order and not a fractionalized phase. But once you start adding other terms, second neighbor, third neighbor terms, then a whole zoo of possibilities opens up and there's evidence for a lot of different phases. Today, I'm going to just talk about uh, the Z2 spin liquid phase, how it could appear. Uh, and then tomorrow, I think I'll say a bit more about other phases that can appear, uh, including what's called the chiral spin liquid, um, or even more exotic phases like the uh, Kitte of Ising anion phase. But let's just today focus on the very simplest example um, of this Z2 fractionalization. Okay. All right. So, how do we proceed? Well, the, we're going to proceed by the part on method. Uh, and I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each spin operator on site I and write it in terms of bosons. These are sometimes called Stringer bosons. Uh, so it's someone alpha beta D dagger I alpha sigma alpha beta. These are the poly matrices for the one half here, B uh, I beta. So let, let's just focus on the simplest case, which is S uh, equals one half. Uh, then this is really a very simple mapping. On each state, you have a qubit. The qubit is spin up, uh, and another state of the qubit is spin down. Uh, and we just say that the spin up state is the state out of some boson vacuum where you add the up boson to it. Uh, and the spin down state out of the boson vacuum is you add the down boson to it. So, so the bosons have a vacuum state, which is fictitious. Uh, if, you, if there's exactly one boson with spin up, then you get the spin up state. If there's exactly one boson with spin down, you get the spin down state. So if you only, if these are the only Hilbert space, states in a Hilbert space, you have a constraint uh, that V dagger alpha, V alpha, sum on alpha, uh, is equal to one. And then it just takes a little bit more work to show that this also works for spin S for general spin. Uh, well, so that's been a half here. Uh, uh, and in general spin, this just becomes two S. So, and that is an exact correspondence as long as you impose this constraint uh, between bosons, spin up boson and spin down boson, with the Hilbert space of spin up boson and spin down boson, and the Hilbert space of a spin with spin S. Uh, and the spin operator corresponds to this operator. And notice that this operator commutes to the boson number. Uh, and so you always stay within the relevant physical Hilbert space. So this is an exact mapping uh, between the theory of spins and the theory of partons, which in this case are bosons, uh, which carry spin a half. And the price you pay for this mapping uh, is that there's a constraint. You must be imposing this constraint exactly uh, to realize the physical Hilbert space. The boson system on its own has many other states that have no correspondence to the physical states. Uh, but if you impose this constraint, um, all of those states are projected out. Okay. Uh, so this constraint is really the, the hard part of the whole thing. Uh, and that's kind of what we want to understand how to impose and what kind of effective theory for the bosons we can, is legal provided it imposes these constraints. Uh, so so the, the procedure then is very standard. Uh, you insert this, uh, this part on decomposition into the Hamiltonian. Uh, then you do some mean field theory on it, and then you do fluctuations. Uh, and while you're doing the mean field theory and the fluctuations, you just have to keep imposing this constraint with the Lagrange multiplier. That's really what you have to do. Okay. <laughs> so, so let's set this up as some kind of path integral, uh, at least formally exact. Uh, so you'll see why this part on method is very much uh, uh, that has a structure of a gauge theory. Uh, and that, of course, would be the connection to what we did last time. That's exactly what I did for the XY model, but in a somewhat more ad hoc way. But here, you know, there are more indices and things are a bit more complicated, which is why I introduced it in the simpler context of the XY model. All right, so uh, 
and you keep that up for a while. Uh, so, so let's just go ahead and write the partition function as a path integral of these bosons. So the partition function now will be z, uh, the integral of a boson on each side with a time tau. And then there'll also be a Lagrange multiplier to impose the constraint. I'll call that lambda i uh, of tau. Uh, exponential minus uh, zero to beta uh, d tau of some Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian here, well, there'll be the, uh, the usual uh, coherent state path integral of the bosons. You'll have a sum on i, d i, d d i alpha d tau. Um, then you'll have the, the, the constraint, which I introduced by the Lagrange multiplier as a delta function, i lambda i, d dagger i alpha, d alpha minus 2s. Um, and then there's a the Hamiltonian, which I won't write out, uh, which is a function of the spins, uh, and the spin is equal to that. So it's a quartic polynomial uh, in the Bose operators. All right, so this is all formal and all exact and an exact representation of the spin system as a theory of bosons with a constraint. Okay, so this theory uh, is, has, a, has a very large symmetry and that's really the symmetry that we are going to focus on over the key to everything. Uh, of course, there's a spin rotation symmetry. Uh, if you had a fully spin rotation invariant interaction, that's actually not essential. You could break that. Uh, and that's a global symmetry. What I'm referring to is a gauge symmetry, which is much, much larger. Uh, and it's an exact symmetry of this path integral. So we really have to pay attention to it if you want to make sense of this path integral. Uh, and what is that exact symmetry? Uh, so. Put it over here, since I have. All right, uh, so the exact symmetry uh, is bi of tau, it goes from bi of tau times e to the, well, I don't know what I've used in the notes, i alpha i of tau. So alpha i uh, is an arbitrary function of time on each lattice site. Uh, so this is obviously a symmetry of this because once I put this, make this transformation, okay, the important point is that uh, the trap, oh, there's too many alphas. Uh, let's call it, uh, let's call it theta i. Okay. Um, so this is the spin index alpha. Uh, the gauge transformation is independent of the spin index. So because it's independent of the spin index, this it just came to solve over here. So the Hamiltonian is obviously invariant under this. Okay. Uh, this B dagger B is invariant under it. Uh, what about this term? Well, this is a place where you run into a little bit of trouble. This term is not invariant under that transformation. However, you still have this lambda I to play with. Uh, I can compensate for the non-invariant of this by changing lambda I. And what is that? So I'll get the sign wrong. Uh, so lambda i goes to uh, lambda i. Uh, so that has a plus. So this would be uh, minus d theta i d tau. So if I make this change, uh, then I can, the, the, when this d by d tau acts on the theta, uh, I can compensate for that by a shift in lambda. All right, so this is an exact symmetry then of this pattern. Uh, so this is a gauge theory. I've just re re taken a familiar model and rewritten it as a gauge theory. And now we want to understand some of the phases of the gauge theory. Uh, in particular, you know, is there a photon? Uh, and if not, is there a bison? And so on. And so these are the questions we can ask. 
Uh, and once we answer those questions, we can then map it onto the kind of lattice gauge theory we've been studying so far. Okay. Um, um, what was I going to say? Right. Oh, one further point. So what we see here with this change in lambda, uh, that lambda is sort of like uh, the time component of a vector potential. But this is exactly how uh, a tau would transform in a U1 gauge theory. And that's kind of, if I take some continuum limit of some field theory, that's how lambda will appear as a tau. Okay. All right, but now, you know, that's fine. It's a gauge theory that doesn't tell us very much because gauge theories can do lots of things. They can be confining phases, Higgs phases, fractionized phases, and so on, and many more that we haven't even talked about. Uh, so we have to now proceed and understand something of this gauge theory. So the procedure that we're going to follow is, some, is you know, is well trodden. There's hundreds of papers on the, in the literature on, the, on it. Uh, and it's basically fairly standard. Uh, the hard part in this path integral is this quartic term. So you do whatever, what, you, what, you know, the next metaphysics always do when you get a quartic term, uh, you factorize it into product of quadratic terms. Uh, and then hopefully you can uh, understand things better. So that's kind of what we're going to do. We'll take this term over here uh, and factorize it. Now, unlike the usual factorization that we do in, say, uh, hot to fog theory or mean field theory or spin density waves or charge density waves, we're going to do the factorization in which we, in a way which we hope will preserve the global symmetry because we, in a spin liquid phase, we don't want to break spin rotation on other symmetries, although you could. But just for simplicity, let's imagine that we don't break any global symmetries. So, so that's where we have to go with this. So we take this term on every bond, and we're going to kind of factorize it. Or in other words, we're going to use a, a Hubbard fraternomic transformation. Okay, so you have a term like this, and you pick a bond, uh, so which is, you know, B dagger I alpha, sigma uh, alpha beta, uh, B I beta, and then you have another site, B dagger I uh, gamma, sigma, this is J, sorry, J gamma, sigma uh, gamma delta, B J delta. Okay, this is some bond I J, uh, and you have a quartic term. So, uh, so you can decouple this by Hubbard Stratton's transformation in many different channels. You pick any pair of these and you decouple it. So you want to, what we want to do here is not uh, pick a factorization which is completely on site because that will just give you uh, expectation value of the spin operator. And we don't want that to have any expectation value. So we're only going to look at things that decouple across the bond. So that's key. And we want to do it in a way that uh, is rotationally invariant. So basically, there's two ways of doing it. Uh, you have, you can do the following. You can have a term like uh, QIJ. Uh, and as you want to have spin rotation invariant, it would be epsilon alpha beta, B dagger I alpha, B dagger J beta. Plus complex conjugate uh, plus mod QIJ squared. So I introduce a bond field QIJ. And there's an exact identity, which is actually proven in the notes. If I now do the path integrals over the QIJ, just by completing the square, I'll get back this term with some factors of two that, again, I refer you to the notes for. Okay, so this is, I can rewrite this as this and just do the integral over QIJ, complete the square and then get back here. Uh, there's also other things you could do. If you wanted, you could also introduce a PIJ, uh, which would be something like B dagger I alpha, B uh, J alpha plus complex conjugate plus mod P squared. 
and you integrate over T, you'll get back this. So there's some a bunch of identities you have to use to make sure this works out. But this is pretty much it. Uh, if you want to use bond decoupling and preserve spin rotation invariance. You know, the only way you can combine two B daggers and make it spin rotation invariance by having an anti-symmetric tensor. Uh, and if you're combining a B with a B dagger, well, then the only thing you can do is take a trace. So just by symmetry, this is about it. If you don't want to break any symmetry, you preserve SU2 spin rotation invariance. These are two different ways of decoupling it. Okay, so now you have a packed integral, which is even bigger. You have the integral over B, you have the integral over lambda. You also have the integrals over Q uh, and the P's if you want. Uh, and there are literally hundreds of papers uh, analyzing the structure of this packed integral. And, you know, you can justify the whole procedure uh, by a large N expansion by making the system, instead of having SU2 symmetry, you have some bigger symmetry, like SUM or SPM or something. Uh, and then that picks out one or more of these decouplings. So I'm going to skip all of that uh, because in the end, what matters is what's the saddle point. So we're going to take some saddle point of this patch integral and look at fluctuations about that saddle. And you just want to have a well-defined stable saddle point about which you can do fluctuations. And then that tells you something about the structure of the gauge theory of the phase that you will take. Okay, so that's so we're just going to imagine that we have a saddle point to begin with, where only the Qs are non-zero. Uh, but before I uh, uh, do that, uh, let's also complete this table. So now we have new degrees of freedom. We have Qs and Ps, uh, and these three freedom don't break the global symmetry, but they do transform under the gauge transformation. Uh, and you can see that from here, for example, the QIJ we transform as QIJ of tau as QIJ of e to the okay, e to the i theta i plus theta j. So it's as two thetas. Uh, and the Qs are going to be like the Higgs field, the H field that we had earlier, which also had a charge two under the U1 gauge transformation. Here it's almost like a charge two, but it's on two different sides. Uh, okay. All right, so there's a lot of messy manipulations here and many of the details are in the notes, uh, but in principle, what we're doing is not complicated. It's just the standard uh, crank that you turn and many body theory and Hartree Fock theory, uh, except you have to just keep track of this gauge invariance at every step, that's all. You know, take a path integral, you find a saddle point and you do fluctuations. That's really all we're doing. It's just that the saddle points have some interesting structure because of the gauge invariance. Um, why, why is there a different result? Oh, so, so well, why couldn't you have simply done the saddle point method on the original Lagrangian? On the original theory without the Qs and Ps? Exactly. Uh, well, you could, but you wouldn't end up getting a spin liquid phase because then uh, what is the saddle point? The saddle point is the B vacuum. Well, that doesn't make much sense uh, because the B have to be constrained. So you want to have some vacuum where the Bs are constrained. Uh, well, if the bees are constrained and you're going to just condense the bees, you're going to have to pick an orientation. So you'll end up getting a ferromagnet or an anti-ferromagnet. Uh, and then when you do the fluctuations, you'll be back to the usual theory, uh, spin wave theory of an anti-ferromagnet. So if you look at the side upon the original theory, you would reproduce after a lot of work, the so-called uh, holstein primakov or dyson millay of uh, calculations. Uh, you want a saddle point that preserves spin rotation invariance, and it's not easy to, and, and any saddle point I take of the original theory uh, will not do that. Because you have to take a saddle point that satisfies the constraint. Okay. Other questions? All right. So, you know, ultimately, there's, a, there's nothing. A bit of arbitrariness here. Uh, it seems totally uncontrolled, but as I said, you can control it by doing a, 
taking a larger symmetry group, and that's discussed in the notes. Uh, and to the benefit of hindsight and a lot of experience, uh, we've now understood to, un you know, we understand something about the general structure of such saddle points. Uh, and I'm just going to proceed with that understanding uh, without justifying every step with complete details, which I've tried to do in the notes uh, with some care. Okay, so let's just take a saddle point uh, where Q is a, uh, take some set of values. Uh, and, and then you, you pick a saddle point and you find the least action saddle point. Uh, and this has been done in the notes and uh, in various papers. So we'll just take the following saddle point, uh, saddle point of this theory on triangular lattice. Uh, with the, well, you take all the keys, saddle point value equals zero, uh, and the Q bars equal to some Q, at least the mod Q bar is equal to some Q dot. Uh, and if you have a triangle lattice, then there's also an orientation to worry about. For the QIJ, you can see from this decomposition that QIJ is minus QJI. So there's an orientation that you have to give to each QIJ. And that's something determined by just looking at the saddle point equations and fixed finding which minimizes the energy. Uh, and so when you do all of that uh, calculation, um, you get some orientation, which is in figure 15. Well, one of the figures in the notes, something, yeah, something like this basically uh, is in the orientation of the QIJ. Average value. Okay. Then you also have a saddle point for lambda, uh, and you take the saddle point of lambda with i lambda is a real number, which is lambda bar. So you have to go off in the complex lambda plane, and then you get a Hamiltonian for just the bosons, uh, which ends up you can do a Fourier transform and uh, write it out. Okay, so you just get a very simple Hamiltonian, we get lambda bar times B dagger I alpha B I alpha minus 2S. Um, and then you have this Q bar IJ as shown in this picture times epsilon alpha beta B dagger I alpha B dagger J beta plus double structure. So this is our Hamiltonian for the bosons. And what we have to do is find its ground state, since it's a quadratic Hamiltonian of the bosons, uh, find a ground state so that this constraint is obeyed, and that will kind of fix the value of lambda bar, find the value of Q bar that minimizes the ground state energy, and then you've got a wave function, okay? So this Hamiltonian is easy to diagonalize uh, because it's quadratic, uh, so you have to just do the usual Bogley ball transformation. And so all of that you can go through, um, and I will spare you essentially all of the details and just tell you what the structure of this ground state looks like. And it, it'll end up looking like uh, essentially uh, a resonating balance bond wave function. So when you diagonalize this, uh, you get a ground state, uh, which looks something like this. Uh, you do a projection operator on two S bosons on each side of exponential minus sum on I, uh, I J, sum F of I, F of I minus J times epsilon alpha beta, B dagger I alpha, B dagger beta, uh, acting on the boson back here. So this is just obtained by the usual Bogley evolved transformations and the usual tricks, which are all spelled out in the notes. So if you look at this wave function, it's, you know, looks very appealing. What does this each factor do? Well, each factor creates one boson on site I, one boson on site J, uh, and then makes a single pair of them. 
And that's exactly a valence bond. So if you have the side I and the side J, uh, then I get this state, epsilon alpha beta, uh, B dagger I alpha, B dagger J beta, acting on the boson vacuum, uh, is of course nothing but one over root two, uh, up, down, minus, down, up. So you get a singlet bond with some amplitude. So the whole purpose of this exercise is to get these numbers. These numbers you get by finding the values of lambda bar and Q bar and diagonalizing this and doing the modular rotation and all of that. It's a rather messy expression. In the end, this expression decays exponentially uh, the function of I minus J. And it gives you with some amplitude F I J, uh, the, of finding a singlet bond between two sides. And there's also a definite phase relationship between all those singlet bonds. And, uh, uh, and then you have to impose this constraint. Uh, and you can do that by a projection operator that you only pick out in this expansion, uh, the states that have exactly two S bosons on every side. So this is kind of a mean field result for an RVB wave function, uh, you know, which is justified in some large n limit where it becomes exact. Uh, but really more powerful than that is the fact that we also, it's a saddle point of a path integral. So not only we can we get a mean field trial wave function, we can do much more. We can look at fluctuations. We can ask, is the spin liquid state stable? And when is it isn't? And in fact, on some lattices, this is not stable. On other lattices, it is stable. In certain dimensions, it's stable. Other dimensions, it's not. So these are all very subtle questions. Uh, and they come about by looking at the structure of the gauge fluctuations about the saddle point. Uh, okay. Uh, you can also look at the excited states, and these are the spin on excited states. So you will get H spin on. You get a definite Hamiltonian, and if it's just some quadratic Hamiltonian, be some on K, uh, some, F, some dispersion E of K. And some spin on Gorgi operator gamma dagger k alpha, gamma k alpha. And so this gamma k alpha uh, creates a spin on. So now you have some definite prediction for, the, for these half spin a half objects. So the, the important point here this Gorgi Wall quasi particle has spin a half, it's a fractionalized particle. The original spin and spin wave theory, all the Holstein, Primakov bosons, and Dyson Monet bosons have spin one. But now you have uh, fractionalized the spin and you have liberated the spin a half spin on, which cannot be created on its own. Uh, but at least in this mean field theory, it just has a dispersion, which you can work out. Uh, and it's again in the notes. And you can then also measure it in principle. And, and you know there have been some indications in neutron scattering uh, and measurements of some kind of spin-on excitation spectrum. Uh, okay. All right. So that's the saddle point, the mean field theory, and what it's giving you is some kind of RVB state. Uh, but now we have to really establish the stability of this state. Uh, we know there's a this gauge invariance lurking. Uh, and anytime there's gauge invariance lurking, uh, there's the danger that you're actually in a confining phase. And confining phase means that this the gauge fluctuation is so strong that your saddle point is meaningless and you go back to some uh, essentially trivial state or, uh, or maybe stable. Uh, and that's why we really have to, uh, you know, watch our step here and then look at the structure of the fluctuations and see, um, see what they lead to. All right, I think it's time for the break. Uh, so any questions before we break? So I, I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, so you mentioned like two kinds of decomposition, this mean field decomposition that would keep the yeah. symmetry. The other decomposition would not give you something like this, right? Would like the, uh, if you didn't set P to zero, it wouldn't give you a Bogolikov kind of Hamiltonian, I guess. It, it will give you, well, it, it makes life more complicated, that's all, uh, but it doesn't change the basic result. Okay. Yeah, you, you could add a term like PID, uh, B dagger, I alpha, B, B alpha, yes. 
Uh, but it's true that with bosons, if you just have the P without the Q, uh, then you'll end up with a theory with a rather different structure. Again, it's hard to satisfy the constraint because there are no bosons in the vacuum. Uh, but if you have both, if you have a Q, adding a P doesn't change very much. Okay. Uh, another thing is that uh, does the existence of a triangular lattice here necessary, or just this could be generalized on any kind of? In, in principle, what I've described can be done on any lattice. Okay. Two or three dimensions. I know there are many papers that have done mm -hmm. basically something like this. Uh, but once we go to fluctuations, uh, then there's a, and suppose I only have nearest neighbor uh, Qs and Ps. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's a big difference between the triangular and the square lattice uh, because the fluctuations end up putting you in different states of the gauge here. So this is what I'm going to talk about just next. So what we'll find is in the triangular lattice, the fluctuations in theory put you in the Higgs space, the fractionalized space. Uh, but on the tri on the square lattice, um, they put you actually in the trivial regime where there's a photon, and so then you have to worry about. Uh, monopoles and all of that. Uh, that's another very long and interesting story, but I will not be talking about that. But at this level, it doesn't matter which lattice you're on, but at the next step after the break, it will matter. Uh, maybe just a question uh, to make contact with some other things students may have seen. Huh? Yes. So you discussed about uh, the relation between the spin and the operator P. What yes. uh, if you had done the Holstein Primakov? Oh, okay, yes, sure. So in Holstein Primakov, that's not what you do. Uh, so in Holstein Primakov, so the HP theory, uh, so let me just do it for S equals one half. Uh, it has a generalization for HP for other studies. So in HP theory, what you say is that S plus uh, is equal to P dagger. Yeah. Uh, and SZ is then B dagger B uh, minus a half. Uh, so just a number operator. Uh, and there's a constraint that B dagger B uh, is less than or equal to one. So these are hardcore bosons. Uh, and the form of the constraint is, uh, I guess, sometimes called non holonomic, or because it's an inequality, not an inequality. Uh, and the spin operator, the raising operator, is exactly one boson. So that's the big difference. So there's no fractionalization here. If you flip a spin, uh, if you create a Holstein Primakov boson, you take the spin from minus a half to plus a half. So the change in the spin uh, is one. So the whole thing from a has integer spin. This boson has integer spin. This little b boson has half integer spin. Uh, because, but of course the spin operator itself is still a spin one, op it has to carry spin one. You remove a boson and you add a boson, the net change is spin. But if, you, if you're able to create a boson on its own, which, which requires a non-local operation, you, you create this gamma alpha on its own, that carries spin a half. But that cannot be done by any local operator, of course, because it also carries a gate charge. Uh, so that's the subtlety, of course. But there are no gate charges in the Holstein Primakov approach. You have only integer spin excitations, and there's no fractionalization. Uh, and you never have to worry about confinement and all of that either. The whole thing is just stable. You start with an ordered phase, and it will just tell you the ordered phase is stable, and there's spin wave excitations. Here, it's more subtle. Uh, we're starting from some liquid phase. Uh, we seem to be getting fractionalization, uh, but we're not sure yet. This, you know, so we have to do the next step to ask what are the gauge fluctuations going to do to this state? Uh, you know, and that this kind of state is, is to connect with other, like, it's sort of like a tensor network state, if you wish. Uh, a lot of these uh, part on this wave function can be written in terms of tensor networks. Uh, but just because you're able to write down such a state doesn't mean it's actually the answer to anything because we have to now also look at stability of gauge fluctuations. Okay. okay. All right. So we'll take a five minute break. <laughs> okay. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank everybody.
May I ask a question in the meantime? Yes, please go ahead. So if I, is it true to understand the, the Q as the, so it's basically the order parameter? Is it true to have the interpretation of uh, the, the parton density? Is that? Uh... Yes and no. Uh, Q is, you know, Q is gauge dependent. So mm -hmm. you have to be careful, uh, but it is, there's a certain, Q has a lot of information once you extract it in a gauge invariant way. Uh, and you could view the Q as kind of an order parameter that tells you, are you in a deeper spin liquid? Are you in a, some other spin liquid? Just knowing the cues and knowing how to extract information from them uh, will give you all of that. And that's pretty much what I'm going to talk about today and also tomorrow. Exactly that. How do you figure out once you have a set of cues, what phase of matter you're in? Uh, that's, yeah. I mean, at the very simplest levels, you could take the magnitude of Q. And if the magnitude of Q breaks translation invariance, then you have broken translation invariance. So it's, it could be an order parameter for a, like a valence bond solid. But if you don't break translation invariance, then it's a bit more subtle. Then you have to figure out uh, you know, what the gauge structure is and what are the gauge invariant excitations here uh, and which phase of matter does that put you in. Yeah. So that's that's pretty much the route I'm going to follow for the, this in the next lecture. Yeah. yeah, so that's a good question. <laughs> and can I ask a question as well? Please? Yes, please. So this, this is about the Schringer representation. So are 
Do I understand correctly? These are these are normal bosons satisfying normal commutation relation. They are not hardcore bosons or anything like that. Well, they satisfy a constraint, but yes, they're normal bosons. Correct. I see. And... So this pattern, oh, I erased the path integral. Hmm. Well, the path integral, the, the kinetic term, B dagger dBd tau. This is completely normal. Okay. Uh, so this, this satisfies the usual quantum uh, commutation relation on the unconstrained Hilbert space. Uh, so if I think, yeah, so once I go to a gauge theory and I think of lambda as a dynamical degree of freedom, then they're normal bosons. <laughs> okay. Is, is, is there a, a good obvious intuition for, for this for this base? So I, uh, a physical uh, intuition. Well, the, so for example, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what you have to reproduce is the commutation relation between the spins. That's what the Schunger boson should realize. And they will reproduce the commutation relation if you just assume they're normal bosons. You mm -hmm. just work it out. You don't have to use the constraint to get the right commutation relations. Uh, and, and that's because the commutation relation, as long as you look at operators that are within the physical Hilbert space, uh, then you can think of them as ordinary bosons. Is, 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 there, is there a continuum limit or a continuum analog to, to, such, a, to such a theory? Uh, well, you could say the nonlinear sigma model is something like that. If you take a, a nonlinear sigma model, uh, those are bosons, but there's a constraint, they have to live on a sphere. Uh, so those are like ordinary bosons living on a sphere in a nonlinear sigma model. So it's like a nonlinear sigma model on the lattice. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, all right, so where are we? Okay, so now we want to look at fluctuations about the cyber point. Just to schematically see where we are, we had some path integral of dB, d lambda, dQ of exponential of some Lagrangian. And effectively what we've done so far when we did Hartree-Fock theory, we, wrote, we reduced this to an integral that just dB, dQ of exponential of some even more complex, some rather complicated Lagrangian. And so far we've solved the equations, uh, dl, dl bar, dl q equals zero, and dl, d lambda equals zero. Uh, this function of q and lambda. And when we solve these equations, we got that state, okay? That's what we've done. This is just a formal way of saying what we've done. And so we found the saddle point. Uh, and now we have to look at fluctuations about the saddle point. Uh, and so this theory lambda bar is a very complicated mess, but it must be invariant under these transformations. It must obey this. And that's really built into the structure of the theory. Uh, but now when we took the saddle point, we fixed lambda bar and q bar to some have some values. And those values are of course obviously not invariant under this. So that's exactly what we did last time, you know, when we had these field h and phi, when you're in certain phases, we fixed some fields to have some value. Uh, we ignored things like ellipsis theorem. We said, well, no, we just work in a gauge where it has a certain convenient value and look at fluctuations about it and that will restore the gauge invariance. That's pretty much what we're doing now also. Uh, we fix these values. Uh, and now we have to look at fluctuations. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to focus the most important part of the fluctuations are the time independent gauge fluctuations. Just going to focus on that. And that's very strongly constrained by this. And you can see that the gauge transformation only act on the phases of the cues. Uh, so, so I will just only look at phase fluctuations of the Q. All right, so I make a huge simplification to this path integral. 
Uh, and I'm just going to say that lambda remains lambda because I don't worry about time dependence for now. Uh, so lambda is just lambda bar. And Q, Ij, uh, <coughs> is some odd Q. <coughs> the amplitude is fixed, but I'm going to allow the phases now to fluctuate. And these can have arbitrary dependence, and I'm call this call this big theta, theta ij of tau. So I'm going to get a theory for the time, I'm not, not even functions of tau, sorry, <laughs> just a function of space. So I'm going to get some theory when in powers of theta uh, that I'm going to expand this uh, Lagrangian here about the saddle point. Uh, and look at the terms which are quadratic in the theta. You know, this is exactly what you do when you're in some broken symmetry phase. Uh, you know, and you want to get the spin wave spectrum. You go to the saddle point, you look at phase corrections, uh, and then you get spin waves and boson modes and all of that. I'm doing exactly that, except uh, I have this gauge invariance to worry about. That's new. Uh, and also these fields live on the bonds. And this, you know, the subtlety here, which we didn't have last time, uh, is that these fields, what's living on the bonds can either be a gauge field or a Higgs field. It just depends on the structure of the subtle point. So we have to ask, is there any gauge field sitting? So it's some combination of the theta IJ gauge field. Is some combination of the theta IJ Higgs field. Uh, and are there any photons? That's really the question we want to ask. Okay. So we're going to get uh, from this Lagrangian, from L bar, uh, we're going to get some quadratic form. Uh, we're going to get some uh, L sub theta. Uh, and we're just going to expand this to order theta squared. Okay. All right, so what is the constraint on the structure of this theta? The constraint is this gauge transformation, which is extremely simple as far as capital theta is concerned. It's capital theta ij goes to capital theta ij plus theta i plus theta j. So this, okay. Now that there's some you know, temptation here to just uh, do a gradient expansion. Assume everything very slowly in space. You know, uh, that's what, you know, if you're doing lattice gate theory, that's what you always assume. You set up a model so that everything happens at zero long distances. Here is a little subtle. We have a lattice. There are anti-ferromagnetic correlations that vary strongly on the lattice scale. Uh, and so we should really keep all momentum. And we have to figure out, you know, is there any special point in the Brillouin zone about which we can expand. It's sort of like when you do for graphene, you know, it's not sufficient to say that graphene is Dirac fermions. Uh, you have to take the full dispersion and find the points in the Brillouin zone about which they're Dirac fermions. So that's exactly what we have to do here. You have to find the points in the Brillouin zone about which there might be a photon, about which there might be a Higgs field or something like that. So, so let's just take a Fourier transform of this. So if you take a Fourier transform, uh, if you take the bond variables and you label them by the midpoints of the bond, uh, then in Fourier space, uh, this becomes, uh, oops, uh, okay. So in Fourier space, this relation here, so I don't need this anymore. I don't need all of this. So if I take a bond theta uh, in the p direction, so p depends on all the different directions of the bond, the triangle lattice is three directions and the square lattice is two and so on. So theta p as a function of k uh, goes to theta p uh, as a function of k uh, minus two, this little theta of k, times cosine of kp 
over to uh, KP. Uh, the bonds in the EP direction dotted into K. Okay. So that's the gauge transformation. So this tells us something about L theta S. So what is this equal to? Well, it can be only one simple thing. Uh, it'll be the sum of our pairs of directions, PQ, with some coefficient, K PQ, times, uh, which will be a function of momentum, theta P of K times cosine KQ over two, minus cosine KP over two, theta P, uh, theta Q of K. Okay, so that's where we account for uh, the full structure uh, of gauge transformations. Uh, this, you know, there's a lot of calculations to be done here. And at you know, one point in my life, I actually did the whole calculation explicitly. Uh, but you can just guess the answer from the constraints of gauge invariance. The phases of the Q uh, must obey to quadratic order some action like this. Uh, because this is the only combination of the theta that's invariant under this transformation. This is just a continuum version of what you do in a vector dynamics. You have gauge invariance, and see, so right, right, everything is F mu squared. Here, I'm trying to do the same thing without making any assumptions uh, of slow variation of the gauge field or the flux or anything for arbitrary momentum. Okay. So now what you have to do is look at the eigenvalues of this quadratic form. Okay, now what happens when you do that for Maxwell theory? For Maxwell theory, if you look at the F mu squared and you just look at its eigenvalues, you'll find that you always get one zero eigenvalue at all momenta. That's simply gauge invariance. That's the gauge uh, degree of freedom, which is not physical, you have to predict it out. Uh, and so he, exactly that happened here. You have some quadratic form. You will always find one zero eigenvalue at all momenta. You just ignore that. We're interested in what happens beyond that. If you did it for the Maxwell theory, so in Maxwell theory, what you'll find uh, is that there's, let's go to two plus one dimensions anyway, uh, in which case there's only two components of the photon here. Uh, if you have two eigenvalues in that case, uh, of the two by two matrix. So in Maxwell theory, You get uh, one zero mode at all k. Uh, that's the pure gauge mode. You forget that. Uh, and then the other mode, as a function of k, uh, you find it has a, a zero, but only at k equals zero. And then it disperses, and that's the physical photon, the transverse mode. Okay. So you do exactly this here. You have some quadratic form uh, on a triangle lattice. It's actually a three by three matrix uh, because it's three different directions. On the square lattice, it's two by two, uh, and and you look at the eigenvalues of this thing. So what you'll find on the square lattice for this quadratic form, uh, again you get a photon. You get this behavior, except that this momentum. Uh, it turns out to be pi over two, pi over two. It's some strange momentum in the blue line zone, but you do get this gapless mode. And that tells you that somewhere, some linear combination of these thetas uh, is a photon, uh, which means that you have to take the genome limit properly and find that photon. So that's a complicated song and dance, and you can work it all out uh, and understand the structure of the photon. Uh, then you have to write on a gauge theory and look at the fluctuations. So in that case, you are really in some sense the Coulomb phase, at least initially. And so you have to understand the structure of the effect of the gauge fluctuations uh, accordingly. Huge amount of work's been done on that. I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, what I want to focus on the simpler case, on the triangle lattice with nearest neighbor couplings. This is for nearest neighbor. I mean, for non-nearest neighbor, it can also be, uh, 
uh, it can also be like the triangle lattice. So for the triangle lattice, what you find is in fact, there is no photon. Uh, as a function of K, there's always a gap. The photon has a mass, uh, and you can take the continuum limit in a way that you can interpret this mass, uh, mass due to uh, charge two, big scale. Okay. Okay, so what this means is that, and this is the ulterior motive for the way I presented things, that some linear combination of these thetas on the lattice behave like the phase of a charge to Higgs field, which was the field H uh, in yesterday's lecture. And because of that, the photon has a mass uh, and it's due to the condensation. The, whatever photon that may have appeared here gets gapped out uh, due to the presence uh, of these different QIJ variables. You know? so, so this is really the heart of what you have to do in any of these part on theories. Uh, you have to look at exactly how this lattice gauge symmetry is realized in the spectrum of physical excitations. Uh, and that tells you a lot. So today we are seeing that it's realized uh, in terms of a mass due to Higgs field. Uh, tomorrow we'll see sometimes you can, it's realized by Chen Simon's term and it leads to a different kind of spin liquid uh, with different properties. And then you, know, you can even get non abelian type of uh, spin liquids by essentially this approach with more complicated sets of QIJ. Okay. But this is really the simplest case. And the details showing you this is exactly the mass of a charge to Higgs field uh, are, are in the notes. Okay, so it's kind of messy, it's not something I can cover on the board in any reasonable length of time, but all the details are there. I mean, I've really spelled it pretty much out. You just have to look at this dispersion eigenvalues of this mode. You have to find this wave vector K. What is this wave vector where it has a minimum? Uh, and then near that wave vector, you have to take a long wavelength approximation, and you will confirm that this is the case. So, you know, it's exactly what you do with graphene. You have some complicated dispersion, you find the K points where it has a zero, you expand about it, and in the end, you see direct fermions. You do the same thing here. In the end, you will see a photon which is gapped out by Higgs field. Okay. All right. So then things are looking promising, at least on the triangle lattice. It looks like this may well be in the fractionalized phase of a Z2 gauge theory. Okay. Now, if it's in the fractionalized phase of a Z2 gauge theory, what we learned yesterday, it must have a Vison. It must be a Vison excitation. It must be a vortex-like excitation, uh, which is needed really to consistently have a theory of the, uh, of the fractionalized phase. Uh, at least that seemed to from our derivation last time. We just forced to have that Vison vortex excitation uh, which must uh, therefore be a relative semion to the spin on over here. So that's the question you can ask here. Does, is there uh, a Vison? Okay. And the answer of course is yes. And it involves uh, another further calculation of exactly this theory. So, uh, all right, but before I erase this, any questions? Okay, so what you have to look for is a different saddle point. So what we have looked for right now is the lowest energy saddle point of this path integral that I have written down about. So you find the saddle point uh, and the saddle point we had uh, was was that QIJ uh, are translation invariant. So you could use momentum. And that is this indeed uh, the lowest energy saddle point. But if you want to find a Vison or a vortex, you have to look for a saddle point which is space dependent. 
the we, you know, Abrikos did that for the Abrikos of vortex of a superconductor. Uh, he had the Landau Ginzburg action to minimize, and he showed it had a vortex like solution. Uh, we are not that fortunate. We have a much more complicated Lagrangian to, to minimize, uh, but you can do it. Uh, and uh, there's a paper with uh, my former student, Yeh Jin He, and uh, Matthias Funk, where we've done a calculation of that type. We just took this Lagrangian and looked for other side of point. They'll have a slightly different, larger energy, of course, but we hope the energy is just only finitely large uh, and see the other side of points of this path integral, which you then have to sum over to get the full theory of the fractionized phase. Uh, so there's also, however, so this is the ground state. But you also have a Vison cycle point. And what does it look like? Well, so now I really want to draw a good triangle lattice. You take the triangle lattice uh, and we go ahead and look for solutions of these equations. But you don't assume translation invariance. Okay, uh, that's terrible. So on. Okay, that's a pretty good triangle lattice. Uh, so what you're going to find, you're going to pick out a center. So because you want to keep 120 degree rotation symmetry, you pick out a center. And then when you're far away over here, somewhere over here, then the solution is translationally invariant. So, so as, so this is as in the ground state. Really far away. The QIJ look very much like the ground state, but more precisely, the fluxes in the QIJ, the gauge invariant combination in the QIJ look exactly the same. But what you will have is a cut. There's a branch cut which can go anywhere you want, but it goes off to infinity uh, and so on. And every time this cut crosses the line, the Q goes to minus Q. It flips side. Now the point is that if I flip signs of Q going to minus Q, it's not going to cost me any energy uh, out here. Because any gauge invariant combination of the Qs, to get a gauge invariant combination of the Qs, I have to take the product of Q, like if I have four sides, any four sides, one, two, three, four, the gauge invariant combination is something like Q12, Q23 star, Q34, Q41 star. These are the only gauge invariant combinations. When you take any such loop over here, it's not going to matter because it's going to cross this line twice. Uh, any loop that you can write down of, of the queues is going to cross this line twice, so it costs no energy at all. So out here, there's nothing, it's just a gauge transformation, it's pure gauge, it's just a different gauge of the same physical solution. But I could take this loop here, that's going to cost me energy. So there's a, just at the center of the of vortex, there's a pi flux, the queues, the product of the queues around the center of a vortex flips soft. And this is going to cost me a little energy. So there'll be some cost over here. And the magnitudes of Q will also change. And you can see a picture of the actual solution in the notes. Uh, and so this is, and then you can see that this is a completely valid and stable, locally stable solution of these equations. So it's another saddle point that's out there. It's an excitation. It's a topological defect. That's a solution of these equations. It costs a finite amount of energy. And then now you can think about it moving around and doing, doing all kinds of things. But uh, it's some background of the cues that tells you what the spin-ons are doing in the background. Uh, and uh, there's some wave function you can write down for the spins also, uh, rather complicated, but anyway, in principle, uh, doable from the prescription that I've given you. All right, and this is obviously then the Bison saddle point. It's stationary, cost a finite amount of energy. Uh, in that sense, it's similar to the uh, uh, 
to the M particle of the toric cord that also is stationary in plus a finite amount of energy. But when you, you know, doing corrections, you're going to find that it has a finite mass, and those are, of course, harder things to compute. Um, well, that's where it kind of uh, Z2 gates theory will come in. Okay. Um, all right. What should I do next? <clears throat> Uh, any questions, by the way? Okay, so so there is a Vaison object here. It's rather heavy, uh, plus a finite amount of energy. Um, the spin-ons are also have a gap, uh, which have, you know depends on the dispersion epsilon k. We didn't work out, uh, but these are the two basic particles of the theory. Just like of our extended x y model, you know we tried to fractionalize this, the x y model to to us to a. Uh, uh, into two, and we found in addition to the fractionalized spin on, they had to be this vortex. And indeed, that's exactly what's happening here, but in a you know, technically much more complicated way. There are a lot of other bells and whistles and momentum dependencies that really can seem rather confusing, but in principle are not so different from what we did last time. Any questions? One question. So, I can't hear you. So, uh, something wrong with your mic. Maybe you can type it on chat and uh, Andrea can read it. So, please write uh, your question. Okay, let me continue. You can interrupt me yeah, whenever you're done. We'll come back. All right. So finally, now I want to. Hello, hello. Just, uh, just, yeah. uh, I have a question. So, uh, how uh, how I can see this uh, branch cast uh, in in cell point? How is what? Sorry. How oh, how I can see this uh, branch cast uh, from solving cell point equation, or um, uh, from the uh, configuration of uh, satisfying. Uh, side of one, okay, so if I if I didn't have it, if the side of, if the branch cut go all went all the way through the sample, without ending at a point, then it's obvious because then it's just a gauge transformation of the original solution. I take the translation of an side point and just do a gauge transformation. By a gauge transformation, I can put a branch cut everywhere, anywhere I want, as long as it doesn't end. Okay. So the only place I really have to check that this is a saddle point solution uh, is that near the point where it ends. There I have to make sure that, you know, that, that, that it's locally stable and so on. So that requires some numerical analysis you've done. Uh, you can also do it in this continuum limit that I've described, you could take the continuum limit and then the problem actually completely reduces it to the average cost of problem because the continuum limit looks exactly the same. So, yeah, uh, so those are two different ways you can see it's there. Either you just bite the bullet and do the numerics, or you take a continuum limit uh, and see that it just reduces to the average cost of solution. Okay, thank you. Or you, you know, go to the toric code and you can find it there too. So it's, there's a lot of, and then there'll be, uh, in fact, connection of this to Z2 gauge theory, which I don't think I'll have time to talk about today. Uh, where you can also see it there. So there's many different ways and they all hang together. But yes, it's not obvious uh, uh, that this should be there. And it was something, uh, yeah. And we wrote a paper, I wrote a paper with Nick Reed where we, you know, we gave these rough arguments, but we didn't, hadn't done the numerics at that time. <laughs> but it seemed pretty clear it had to be there. All right, uh, okay, so now uh, what, I, what I do want to talk about is to think a little bit about the motion of this Vizar. How does it move around? And this is the, the subtle part that I began my lecture with, with this berry phase. So there's a very subtle berry phase here. That's actually the key uh, to everything, uh, to understanding the structure of the gauge fluctuation and what happens when you go out of the spin liquid phase. Uh, and there the underlying spins the fact that the number of bosons on each side 
uh, you know, for spin a half with exactly one and nothing else, uh, turns out to be extremely important. So what are we going to do? Okay, so what we're going to take, imagine that we have found a wise on saddle point solution. Uh, and we're going to let it move around a little bit very slowly. By slowly varying, say, the parameters of the Hamiltonian or something like that, and see what kind of background is it moving in. It's, you know, it can hop from one side to the next, but let's imagine that, as in any Berry phase calculation, it hops and then it comes back to where it started. Okay. So, again, I need a good triangle lattice here. <laughs> And here there's you know, a nice figure in the text that we worked hard to draw. Okay, but I'll try to be different. So imagine I have a Y zone. Uh, uh, it's sitting over here uh, with a branch cut that goes out there. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I get it right. Uh, I don't know. This is going to some strange place. Ah, uh, here we go. Well, forget it. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is a wise one sitting here. Um, well, actually, no, let me, yeah, all right. Okay. All right. So, and let's say it starts moving around. Okay. So it moves from here to there, it hops from here to there. And there's some, we don't want to change everything out at infinity. So, you know, the branch cut, let's say it goes this way. You can put it any way I want, but you're going to get a branch cut over this way. Uh, and then it goes here, and then it goes here, and here, and here, and then comes back. Okay, so now I've come back uh, with the wise on to the original position uh, and the branch cut has followed me as I went around. Uh, and when I'm back, uh, I have the branch cut going out to infinity, but the final state doesn't look quite like the initial state. It's got this loop over here, which I didn't have in the initial state. Now the rules of the very phase uh, calculation there's some gauge arbitrariness in any very phase calculation. Say that you, you undergo a closed loop in some parameter space. Here is the parameter space of the Hamiltonian that was localizing the y zone at this point. Uh, I mean, the wave function of the y zone could be straight out, but the center was at this point. Uh, and then we went around and came back on the one elementary loop. So, uh, so the y zone therefore came back to the state. Uh, but it doesn't, the wave function doesn't look like the original state. And that often happens in the very phase calculation. You do some first look, the wave function doesn't look the same. Because every time you move forward, there's a gauge arbitrariness in the wave function. So what you have to make sure is that the gauge of the final wave function uh, is exactly the same as the original wave function. And then there's a gauge invariant very phase that's left over. So we, here we have to do a gauge transformation to get rid of this branch cut. Okay, this, this loop over here. We have to do a gauge transformation to get rid of the loop, uh, and then we'll be back to the original state. So that's, so there's a, so I want to pick out a special site here. Uh, let's call it the site zero. This is the site zero, and there's boson sitting there, okay? So what I want to do is I want to do a gauge transformation so that these branch cuts disappear. So I have to flip Q to minus Q on every one of these bonds. Okay. Now that's easy to do. So, so I have all these bonds. Uh, one end of them is on the site I and site zero on the other side I. So these are the sites I over here. So I want Q zero I and only those Q zero I to go to minus Q zero I. And if I do that, do a gauge transformation that accomplishes that, I will get rid of this cut. Okay. Well, I've erased the full gauge transformation, but it's easy to see what that gauge transformation is. 
is that B0 should go to minus B0, and all the Bi's can remain the same. So as long as I flip the sign of this boson over here, I'm going to come back to the original state when the Vison executes a loop. So this particular gauge transformation, the fact that there's a minus one, that is the very phase. Okay, so I don't have time to go to all the details, but if you carefully follow the prescription that Barry laid down and how you compute the very phase, it's exactly this prescription. So how many bosons do we have on each side? Well, uh, two S bosons. So, so the very phase, the gauge invariant very phase, when for boson encircling the site is equal to minus one to two S. So it's minus one for half integer spins and just one for where there's no very phase uh, for an integer spin. All right. Uh, okay, so this is really uh, eventually in the Z2 gauge theory, when you map it onto Z2 gauge theory, this is exactly the reason I had the strange phase factor that GI on every side is minus one to the two S. And the way you see that is you go back to the Z2 gauge theory, look at its y on excitations and see what happens when they encircle a loop and they pick up exactly this factor of GI, whatever the value of GI is. So easy way to see it, since I'm running out of time, uh, you know, um, the GI is the gauge charge sitting on each side. So there's an electric charge sitting on a side and you take a magnetic charge and go around it, you pick up an Arnold Bohm phase factor, which is exactly the, the net gauge charge, uh, which is minus one for half integer spin uh, and one for integer spin. So you end up you know, with very different Z2 gauge theories to describe the fluctuations uh, of the y uh, because of this, this very subtle phase factor that appears when you move the y around. All right. This is probably the most subtle thing I've talked about, uh, but it's absolutely crucial then to the theory of, uh, of the structure of the spin liquid and further on in its phase conditions, which I'll say a bit more about uh, tomorrow. Okay, I'm almost out of time, so just the next few more minutes. I uh, hope happy to answer any more questions. So, so if I understand correctly, the models today is different from yesterday because uh, none of the gauge fields are dynamical, right? Was none of them what, sorry? There's no dynamical gauge fields anymore. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, there is a dynamical gauge fields. These capital thetas and these Qs are all dynamical. I've just been talking about the uh, the, the structure of the saddle point and certain important features of it, but in the end, they're all dynamical. So let me just summarize here. So, you know, this is the claim. I haven't fully established it. There's still one more step that uh, I will talk about next time. So we have the extended XY model. And today we looked at, uh, uh, you know, spin S antiferromagnets on various two dimensional lattices. We looked at triangle, but it works on many other lattices. And you can also look at bosons uh, with uh, density uh, S. So the density is just S. So when S is an integer, it's the integer filling. Uh, okay, so all of these models are described by the following theory, uh, which is H uh, is minus some on um, some on plaquettes of um, Z, 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 it's on K here, uh, minus G, uh, some on uh, sites of the X. And then there are these gate charges which is product 
x x x x so you take product of x on four on all the sides coming into a link uh, and this must be equal to minus one to the two x we have reduced everything to this problem uh, i haven't quite yet there's one more step to go from the large and this theory uh, from this theory that i've described to get this model but this is the model at the end this is the master model uh, which whose phases we will discuss a little bit uh, next time. Uh, it just is ordinary easy to gauge theory uh, with uh, this constraint on the gate charters. Okay. So that's the claim. And this is a completely quantum dynamical Z2 gauge theory. Uh, this the original model here has a U1 gauge field with all kinds of dynamical fluctuations, but we just assume they are gapped and we don't worry about that. Uh, and so you end up in the spin liquid and across its confinement transition, a description by this model. Okay, I think I really do have to end now because there's somebody else coming to this room. Okay, so please okay. Uh, get to the discussion tomorrow then. Thank Good you, Dumbira. Thank you. See you tomorrow.